Welcome to Cars on Call. I am Gashon Raldist and automotive journalist Steve Schutz. I want to say I want to say something really quick. Uh, we have drama surgeon Stefan Moran and car collector, consultant, and expert Adam Sudson. And uh, my uh, business does actually support this uh, podcast. So I want to say something because March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. So I'm going to put a plug in, and that is get your colonoscopy. There is a big thing. Uh, called Cologuard. And Cologuard is a test where you poop in a box and you send it in. Don't oh, do that. Okay. Don't do that. I got a funny story about that. If mm. you get a colonoscopy, you get it at the age of 45 to start if you're average risk. And if you have a precancerous polyp, it gets removed and colonoscopy prevents colon cancer. I used to find colon cancer myself 25, 30 years ago. I'd find it about once a month. It was just a normal thing, sad, but normal. Now I go three, sometimes six months without seeing a colon cancer because so many polyps that were going to become cancers got removed. With Cologuard, they say, don't do a colonoscopy and prevent the cancer. Let the cancer happen and we'll detect it. So if everyone got a Cologuard, I would go back to finding colon cancer every month. Uh, it's a terrible test. I hope it goes off the market. So there's my plug for colon ca cancer awareness. My I did. I had my colonoscopy just the prior week um the prep is no pleasure but hey i had i went from colonoscopy three years five years now i got the 10-year hall pass because they got all the pops out it's a big deal um, well and the thing about the inconvenience and the unpleasantness about which many jokes were made about the the, the night before it is way easier than having it Hey, but you know what? The vodka and the prep goes well. You just can't have red wine, <laughs> but you can have white wine or vodka. And uh, But hey, I want to tell you a funny story. You mentioned that. So bef the days before Cologuard, we used to do a thing called Hemocult. So Hemocult would be where you you got this little plastic, you gave this card, cardboard card to your patient. They would um, take a little popsicle stick, put the stool on there, mail it back in, and you would put the drops on there to see if they had blood in their stool. Right. Oh, one day I'm sitting in my office. I hear my nurse go, ah, ah, ah. and I'm like, what? I run in there. Well, the patient didn't read directions. The patient wiped their butt with the cards, <laughs> folded it up and put it in the envelope and mailed it. Oh. it was stool everywhere. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, that was at Whiteman Air Force Base. Oh my, I'm, I mean, John, I can hear Joe to this day screaming but yeah the, the patient did not you know obviously it was a male because male are not going to follow directions or read them i mean otherwise moses would well, they scan the desert. yeah yeah we scan. just scan the directions I mean, moses wouldn't have wandered the desert for 40 years if he just was stopped and <laughs> asked a woman or asked for Stop directions. the chevron stations <laughs> <Yes>. hey man <laughs> yeah get me out of here oh uh, before we you get don't get openers like this anywhere but call <laughs> <laughs> no, before we get struck by lightning for Stefan's sacrilege, uh, let me just say that uh, it is Easter season, and for G people, that is a big deal. So Stefan's going to talk about why there's a huge, huge Jeep jamboree in a certain location. I'll still let Stefan get into it. He's going to do, of course, trauma surgeon safety. We are the only podcast or YouTube show that has an actual trauma surgeon talking about his experience operating on car crash victims, but also has done research on car crashes. So uh, his safety segment is a highlight. And then we've got Adams. Adams, you have a really cool muscle car that you spotted. We're going to talk about that. And um, the three of us have been talking, and we decided we're each going to have a chance periodically to have a rant. And it can be whatever the hell we want. And I'm I'm doing the first rant today. Uh, we're, we're, th we're, we're th three old guys with gray hair. We're expected to rant. Yeah. We're yeah, expected is, to be curmudgeoned. It's the automotive equivalent of get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. So we're doing that. And I, I got a rant today. I'm, I'm pissed off about it. I really am. I can tell. You're a little fired up. I see. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we I'm glad we're making this a regular segment because I have gone off on multiple rants on this. <laughs> we, mean, have. You have. we have. It's been well, you were doing it before we had a name for it, Steph. Yes. Now we have a name for it. <laughs> right. An actual place. Um, and then finally, we have done a thing where we say, hey, we are CEO of the company. And as CEO of a company, you can make your own car. You can have your company make you something special. It has to be currently for sale. In other words, you can take an engine that's currently for sale and stick it in a different vehicle, different transmission, that kind of thing. But you can make something special, have your team do it for you. And we're going to do that with Jeep because, again, this is a Jeep month. 
uh, or Jeep season with uh, with Easter. So without further ado, Stefan, you want to talk about Jeep and and the and the Jamboree? Go to it. Yeah, once a year. Uh, formerly, I had a 1979 Jeep CJ7. Had it uh, all through college. Um, actually, flipped and rolled it, but we all survived. Thank goodness. Um, it was a great vehicle at the bar, time. Probably. Yeah, we had a roll bar that we hit so hard upside down. The roll bar actually blew out the rear tires. But I came around. I was uh, driving on a country road coming back from the lake, and hit some gravel and mud where they'd been logging. And that short wheelbase, narrow wheelbase, um, it it went out. But anyway, the Jeep does this big jamboree in Moab and every year at Easter. And Jeep always brings out some super cool concept Jeeps that they know are going to do nothing but increase sales, increase desire. I mean, the Jeep culture is huge. It, it really is an amazing thing to see how people love to customize these, take them off road. And our good friend Andrew Clark sent me some pictures. Actually, you guys too. Um, he had his Rubicon out there in the mud, four wheeling. He has done some tremendous things. We'll have him back on the show one time to talk about what he's done in that Jeep. And I think he's the only guy out there that has more has spent more on aftermarket parts and conversion than he did on the actual vehicle. But, wow. but that's just Andrew. I mean, he's got some our awesome. hero. He's a total hero, man. I mean, I call, I, I spoke to him today. He's what a great guy. But anyway, so they brought out four new concepts. Let me do my share screen thing and pull them so up. So the idea is that Jeep corporate is bringing red meat for the fans, basically. They bring yeah, these, absolutely. these cool things, and it's to get people who are already Jeep people more excited. Even and as more, you're yeah. going into this yes. step, and I hate to like, like slide this in, no. but you know, we, we talked several episodes ago about uh, just the whole marketing concept, and the first of the marketing concept is not product, but it's market. Who yeah, are the people you're who selling care? an idea. And they're selling all an emotion. Oh, this is yes. the market. This is the market. They're selling a lifestyle, an emotion. It's kind of, you know, Apple really nailed this. Our other companies have as well, but they're selling this whole lifestyle, this concept. And most of these Jeeps will never see this, but it's just way too cool. So this first one I pulled up a picture is called the Jeep Lowdown 392. And I'm homage to an earlier Jeep. This thing is 42 inches of BF Goodrich crawler rubber. I mean, I thought Mickey... Thompson's at 37 were gigantic tires, but 20 inch wheels. It's got the B locks on there and B locks. I asked Andrew about B locks. I didn't really know what that meant, but where the B lock tire is the actual rubber part is attached to the rim. So you can drop the pressure down to 10 to 15 PSI and the, the rims will still turn the rubber. If you have a regular tire and do that, the, the tire will just slip off the rim and come off the rim. So this mm -hmm. has got this big old B locks. And what's crazy is this they put this massive tires on this Jeep Wrangler, but this, it's the standard suspension on the Rubicon. So they're taking the limits of what they already have to show people what you could actually do. Very cool. I think it's just, of course, badass Jeep looking Wrangler. Um, the next one, which I really find cool, and the paint color is not my total color, but this is this is kind of a this is the four door. Um, they call this the Jeep Willys Dispatcher. So it homage to the old Willys Jeep. It's got some steelies. It's got narrower tires. It does have a leather interior. I'm not, it's kind of this like dark lime green paint monotone. I'm, I know Steve-O probably thinks this is the greatest color ever. Steve-O likes all the peep green colors. I really like it also before Steve even speaks up about it. I mean, when he first showed it, I think it fits the character of the vehicle. I wouldn't want it on anything much bigger. But yeah, I mean, well, I like it. And the beige steelies, it looks, it's got beige steely rims. So listen, it's just got solid rims. They're like 15 inch rims on this thing with giant narrow tires. Very let's cool. Go, let's go ahead and say that it's probably taken a little bit of a page out of the Bronco workbook. Yes. To have yes. done this because it was kind of a mouthwash green looking color, but more sophisticated inside with the dark brown and the leather. I don't know. I, th I I think this one hits a marketability sort of nerve. Absolutely, because you know? everybody doesn't want 37-inch, 38-inch tires. I had the same I thought, Adams. I thought this was a takeoff of the new Heritage Broncos. Yeah, I like. I would pay it. back, paying back to the Willys honor. Yeah, I think it's great. Then the third one they rolled out, which I think is really cool looking. This is the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon High Top. 
So this is the Rubicon with, once again, the four-door truck version with massive tires. It's got this cool kind of retro copper gold metallic with black two-tone paint. Very cool looking. I you know, it's sort of got elements of the old, I guess they call it the scrambler, but the truck yes. like the, yeah. the honcho, but I love the scrambler paint scheme. With the big flat fender flares on it. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Yeah. And then the final concept, which I thought was actually I do like a lot, is the Jeep Vacationeer. Um, so they took the Grand Wagon, the, the um, what's it called? The Grand Wagoneer. Grand, yeah. Yep. The new Grand Wagon, which I don't like because of that C pillar, which drives me insane. C pillar is <laughs> the very last one in the corner. They got this notched window in the back. I'm like, if that would be squared off, I'd be fine with it. But I don't know what that notch is supposed to mean or do, but I think it just looks stupid. And though I rode in this, we, um, when I went skiing back in February, we rented one of these very nice on the interior, very nice ride. I was really impressed, but this is their, the grand Wagoneer. They throw the tent on the back and it's got some cool, very cool led light driving lights on the front. It's got like four quad sets of leds on the front with a tow bar. I mean, a, a tow hook um, that goes to a winch. Big tires. I love white roof as well, Stefan. Yes, I mean, and it's got, yes. So, so this is, listeners, this is a, more of a, maybe like a metallic lighter green with a white rooftop, kind of like the old Broncos, the old National Harvesters. Once again, throwback features, but I think they they totally work and make this, this is a good looking Grand Wagoneer to me. And this, un unlike the Porsche Dakar, I bet that tent option is not $7,000. No. <laughs> no. This is Everybody. my, I think my favorite concept. I would make this blue instead of green, but I like yeah. the tent on the, on the top. And let's face it, both the Gladiator and the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer are not selling well at all. The, the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer have really struggled. The reason you rented one is they're dumping them into the rental fleets. So you'll see a lot of them around. When I see one on the road, it's almost always a rental car. This is not selling well. If they made it more interesting looking like this, they would sell better. I the one we rented right. was the top of the line one, Steve-O. It was totally maxed out. It wasn't entry-level Wagoneer. Yeah, because customers aren't buying them. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. Yeah, you I know, think... I, 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 I would foretell that we're going to be talking a little bit about what could sell in our, you know, player, the CEO for a day segment. But, you know, I mean, I look at this, too, and I think that that people would buy this. You know, the, the, the green is a little crazy, yeah. but I'm just talking about the option package, the look, the stance, the whole bit. And I'm going to be a detractor because I, Stefan, if you're talking about the ABC and or D pillar, that little Hoffmeister looking kink, I think yeah. that's a little bit international scout ish. And I like it. You know, everybody's got a different opinion, but I kind of like that. Yeah, I like it too. I, You know, this is something, they need to do something to goose sales. They can't just keep dumping these Grand Wagoneers into the rental fleet. Yeah. Uh, what's a loaded Grand Wagoneer, which supposedly when they first launched them, that was supposed to be a $100,000 vehicle. What's that doing in a rental fleet? It really shouldn't be there. And I think the only reason it's there is because people aren't buying it. But let me ask this question of Adams. Adams, I have been surprised. My sister, who's used to be in advertising, told me this, and you've talked about this, but talk about it a little bit more. A lot of advertising, hello, Rolex, is advertising to people who already own your product. That's what this is. Yep. Um, it, it, if you appeal to the fan base or what what before we used to call them influencers, uh, you would just talk about people who at a cocktail party, if asked the question, what kind of watch would you buy? What kind of car would you buy? Those are the people who are highly influential. And there used to be an old uh, ratio. I don't know if it's still correct. That somewhere between three and a half and five to one, the credibility of a person speaking to another person, that the credibility was many times higher than the equivalent amount of advertising dollar. So if you're going to spend half a million dollars on advertising, you can get three to five million dollars out of somebody saying, I love the product and here's why. And they believe it. It's all about the fan base. Yeah, I just find that I find it fascinating. I mean, you know, Porsche advertises their 911 and you can't buy one. You have to you have to wait, get online to buy and you can't just buy one or get in line to buy one, I should say. Rolex advertises all the time. You can't just go to a store and buy a Rolex. They're back they're backward. 
And it's uh, to me, it's interesting. And I, you know, Jeep, you can buy a Jeep, but it's again, you're fanning the flames of, of fandom. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, trauma surgeon safety. All right. Let's move on to safety here. Um, so I want to talk about two things that have happened. Um, in the past episodes, I've talked about Tesla and autopilot and talked about how we are implementing these automatic driving systems in this country. And it's really kind of like beta software. Um, they're just companies are throwing on the road and see how it works. But in mid-March, the National Transportation Safety Board announced that they're investigating Ford for a Mach-E that was involved in a fatal crash in San Antonio. So what happened was the Mach-E was driving down the road. The person had it on the full auto and it ran into a stationary Honda CRV on the interstate. This is not an uncommon crash in these automated driving systems. There's been multiple Teslas you read about that struck an ambulance, struck a fire truck that was parked. And in this case in San Antonio, the driver was killed. And one of the requirements from the National Transportation Safety Board is all crashes or fatalities involving an automated driving system, whether partial or full, has to be reported for examination. They have to report all these fatalities on advanced driver system systems. And the NTSB comment was they're investing this crash, quote, due to its continued interest in advanced driver assistance systems and how vehicle operators interact with these technologies. Well, let's kind of put things a little bit back into perspective. So anytime you have a vehicle that has ADAS, which is just short for automated driver assistance systems, we just call it ADAS, a crash with ADAS, a crash with Waymo, a crash with Tesla, it makes the national news. And um, it's like an electric car catching on fire, though way more gas cars ever catch fire than electric cars. But it, it, it makes the news. It's something to talk about. But let's think about it. The last data I could find came from 2016 to 18. There were 566 people that were killed and 14,000 injured by striking a stationary vehicle. So what we're really talking about here is four to six automated driving vehicles striking a parked vehicle. And the data we talked about on the previous show that from Waymo and their automated driving vehicles, that they actually, you, you know they drive better than a human do in the right circumstances, the right situations. Um, they do better than we do as humans. I mean, humans are prone to distraction. I've talked about on this show. But we're not totally yet there on the software. And unfortunately, when there is something that goes wrong, we all jump up and want to, um, you know, wave our arms and say, this is awful. We shouldn't be doing this. But think about it. If you had a, if you had a medication that 566 people died um, when they took it, and you had a medication that six people died when they took it, which one did you take that had the lower side effects? I mean, it's pretty much not. Um, we're going to get there. But the question is, how do we get there? Well, um, you know, I talk all the time about the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. And they're the ones that do all these car ratings. They really are based by insurance companies looking at lowering the rates, lowering their costs by decreasing the carnage on the highways. Well, they introduced a new rating program to encourage automakers to incorporate more robust safeguards into the personal driving automation systems. But the thing I want you to understand is their rating is a very driver centric. So what I mean by that is they're looking at how does the system evaluate the attention of the driver? Okay. So if there's, if your system does not constantly annoy the driver, Hey, put your hands on the wheel. Hey, look at the road. Hey, put your seatbelt on. Hey, you're going too fast. If you're, automated driving system doesn't do any of that you're not going to do well with insurance for highway um, safety's ratings so it's defined and, you're saying dm what they call dms so they've got AD, adas which is automated driver assistance systems then you have dms which is driver monitoring systems and then you have to have you have to have both right <laughs> right so yeah exactly steve so what the iihs wants to do is they want the dms to be fully 100 incorporated into the adas so what IHS does not want is where you just click on your ADAS systems and you pick a book up, put it in front of you and read the book going down the interstate. 
Or you take your seatbelt off, climb in the back and pour yourself a cocktail. That's what they don't want that. They want you sitting in the seat, looking down the road, basically treating this as we do in aviation pilot and a co-pilot. So you change your role from being the pilot to becoming the co-pilot and everything in aviation. We fly, we'll, we'll, we'll say new, we're going, we're going to climb to 10 K the co-pilot goes 10 K check pilot goes 10 K check. So this is this back and forth checking between a pilot and a co-pilot. That's what IIHS wants the human interface to become with an ADAS system. So they, their quote is most of them don't include adequate measures to prevent misuse and keep drivers from losing focus on what's happening on the road. Well, I keep saying we're not there yet, but we're going to get there where I would rather honestly with the way most Americans drive, look at our statistics on alcohol, our statistics on um, distracted driving. A DASC will do better than the average American driver, but we're still in the early software issues. Um, so let me, I want to pull up a slide here that kind of shows. You know, Steph, as you're, pulling, as you're pulling that up and just a little bit of filler here and yeah. the, the, the pilot co-pilot scenario is a great one because you actually have another human being overlooking yes. and Hey, did you check your gauges? Are you looking at what you're doing here where this is really almost like a uh, pilot turning over the controls to autopilot. And yes. then they become so uninvolved and that's where it almost seems less safe to me, but you're probably about to prove that with statistics. Right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about, but so here is, it should be pulled up here. There's slide. This is from the insurance insurance NC for highway safety.org talking about the partial automation, automation safeguard ratings. So their requirements when they rate the system. So you got to understand how they're rating the system to determine if you like the result. So it's important. So number one, monitors both the hand, both the driver's gaze and hand position. So this is where the system is monitoring you. Uses multiple types of rapidly escalating alerts to get driver's attention. So what this is talking about, like the guy when the, that was driving the Ford, the system is warning him, hey, 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 something's weird, something's weird, but he's not paying attention to it. So the escalating alerts to get the attention. Fail just safe for, just a second, Savan. It looks like you have a uh, visible warning followed by a audible warning audible. followed by shaking the seat. Yeah. A lot of stuff happens. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So this is what they want to see happen. Fail safe procedure slows vehicle, notifies manufacturer, keeps automation off limits for remainder of drive. So basically you screw up, you don't participate. The system turns off. You can't use it anymore. So you get a reset. Automated lane chains must be initiated or confirmed by the driver. So you're coming up fast on a car in the right lane. The car wants to go to the left. It will not go to the left unless you confirm it or you hit the brakes and slow down. Then adaptive cruise control does not automatically resume after a lengthy stop or if the driver is not looking at the road. So... So you can see lane steering does not discourage steering by the driver. This is one thing I have to agree with. My wife's car has that lane departure warning. And when you want to go turn to get the lane and you're going against it, it fights you. It shouldn't yep. fight you. If I yep. take the wheel, let me have the damn wheel. Okay. So I, I like that. And then automation features cannot be used with seatbelt unfastened. Um, some systems you can unplug the seatbelt and see, it'll let you do automatic pilot. No, I, that, I agree with that. And then automation features cannot be used with an automatic emergency braking or lane departure prevention warning disabled. So you can't disable parts of the system. You get this all or nothing principle. So they ranked all these driving systems and I got them pulled up here, but I'm just going to briefly, the only acceptable rating came from Lexus teammate with the advanced drive option. You have to purchase the second option. Then the only two marginals were the General Motors um, Sierra with Super Cruise and the Nissan Pro Pilot, everybody else got a poor. But remember very clearly, this is based upon these driver centric interaction features. Okay. Not in the actual capability of the system to do what it says it's going to do, but what they're ranking it is on, they feel there has to be more driver interaction. So, you know, I look at this scale that they do and the ratings. 
I don't put a lot of, I mean, I mean, let me see how to put this. We're going to get to the point where we already know from Waymo's data and Tesla's data that far by most instances, the automated driving assistance systems are better than the human. We know that. When they have the right input data, they do better than, they do screw up on occasion, but they don't screw up near to the propensity that we as humans do. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't happen. They're, they are better than we at driving. Okay. But there's still some problems and glitches in the software that make it kind of unacceptable, a little bit hard to accept right now. But I think that's going to change as we move forward that it's going to become more acceptable. But so the IHS systems, you know, but I think what we have to, they're also... Just, let me just has, say something really yeah. quick because I think this this summarizes it for people who are not you know geeks in in uh, automation. Uh, I drove in, I, I rode in a Waymo car in San Francisco. It was amazing. It was obviously the future, a better driver than humans. I have no, I agree with you totally about that, Stefan. But somehow, other manufacturers, the OEMs, basically the the legacy manufacturers, have decided we're going to do it with less computing power than Google has. Yes. And they kind of suck. You got Waymo, yeah, exactly. it's going to be really great. I think they're going to have to just buy Waymo software because they just don't know what they're doing. I, we talked about that, that the, most of these companies, it's the beta test pilot. And I don't want to be a beta test pilot. And what's interesting is Germany, I've talked about Germany, they have very limited places that you can use these terms. But Germany said, you cannot use the term autopilot for vehicles in our country. Right. So Tesla had to change it to auto drive. So the whole, in my mind, I agree that this is driver assistance is not autopilot. And the terms need to change. So expectation needs to change. Yeah, you put your seat back, you lay back, you're looking down the road and the car is driving, passing, but you're still looking at the road, okay? But Tesla calls it autopilot, enhanced autopilot, full self-driving capability. But the driver still has to handle the routine driving task, driving task. The driver has to monitor how the automation is performing. The driver has to remain ready to take over if anything goes wrong. I mean, the fact that the driver didn't take over when there's a parked ambulance with lights flashing on the interstate stopped and didn't see it and crashes into it. No, I'm sorry. That's the driver's fault. So, you know, I think that we will get there eventually where every everything is automated. You have vehicle to vehicle uh, communication. Yes, the software is better, but until then, it's a co-pilot pilot role. It is not an autopilot ignore what's in front of you role. Yeah, by the way, that, insult to injury, that, they're going to charge by the month for a subscription yeah. for this. Deal. Yeah. We all know this. <laughs> That's but, right. Yeah. Okay. We got. We have to move on because we're we're short of time. But um, Adams, let's go ahead and talk about your your car sighting because I'm frustrated by the whole automation thing. It's such a mess now. So I, I'd much mess, rather yes. talk about your car spotting, which was cool. Well, I'm about to show you a car that had no autopilot <laughs> at all, right there. I love it, folks. Folks, what we're looking at here is a car that you had to pay attention when you were driving because in 1964, and this I believe is a '65 model uh, Pontiac unleashed upon the unsuspecting public, and it really was kind of serious and secretive if you want to read the whole story, something called a GTO. And it was basically uh, our hero of this story would be none other than John Z. DeLorean, who we have a photo of his dashing self. Uh, he was the, the youth market. He's the dude there on the right. You know, it's funny. Back then when people were 30, they looked 52. But um. <laughs> But, you know, he, he decided or, or, or he, he uh, proposed that uh, GM, in this case Pontiac, take a mid-sized vehicle, what they called an intermediate at the time, which was a Tempest, and put a big honking motor in it. He had seen the earmarks of the people who were the hot rodder scene, people who were uh, taking lightweight, older sort of throwaway cars and putting in big motors and, you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal now because you're thinking, oh, okay, well, so they put a fast motor in a smaller car. What's the big news about that? Well, at this time, it was huge news. And he was the first one to do it. And some people would call him father of the muscle car. If you 
disagree with that, put it in the comments, but that's pretty much the guy who did it first. I totally agree. And yeah. you know, he did, he, yeah. th think about how crazy this is. Yes. He chooses the <laughs> name GTO. What other GTO was launched? In <laughs> he stole it. I mean, it's just like outlandish. It is such an in-your-face to Ferrari. Uh, the GTO standing for Gran Turismo Omologato, which was the homologation thing. And there's the heartbeat right there uh, underneath the hood of a GTO, which, again, was this little unsuspecting secretary, teacher's car, whatever, Tempest. He pops in a bigger motor. You could have gotten a 389 with the single four barrel, which was like three and a quarter horse. Uh, and it had a little bit wider tires, a, a whopping 7.5 inch wheel with red line tires. And you can you can thank him also in the red line tires by Goodyear for launching a zillion Hot Wheels with the same red line tires. This one we're looking at here is the triple deuce. So that's three two barrels in a row. Uh, it's insane. Three. To, I mean, I don't know. If, uh, our listeners don't know what it's like, but I rebuilt a carburetor. And I ended up with more pieces on the table that were somewhere supposed to have gone somewhere in the carburetor. <laughs> and to have three of these things, I can't even yeah. imagine trying to port and tune the jets on three carburetors. And they got to be synchronized. And yes. Oh my God. Of the whole throttle link engine. And all yeah. This was a pretty sophisticated little piece of equipment. Absolutely. So they had warmed overheads a little bit bigger exhaust, a dual exhaust, a lower uh, rear end uh, uh, ratio in, in, in the differential. And this one, if you checked the box and paid an extra $26, you could get the uh, the triple deuce thing, which put it up to uh, 350 horse, oh, which wow. th those were, you know, sort of almost criminally underrated because they were trying to avoid the uh, insurance surcharge even then. And it was a pretty quick car. I mean, you know, like by today's standards, we'd laugh at it. But this was the GTO, and it was the 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 genesis, the crucible, the goat. Yeah, it was. It, it, there you go. It, that, it was the goat. It's the goat, it, man. Called him the goat, and it became the goat in a whole yes. different vernacular. That it, this is the goat. I, 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 you know, I think. Let me scroll back to this picture. For that era vehicle, um, so listeners, I got, I got the two door GTO pulled up here. I mean, you probably most people think it's a little bit dated, but it was so badass in its time that to me, I still think when I see a GTO, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. It's just because I have memories of that. I don't know how my kids would react to seeing this car, but I think it's just got a certain je ne sais pas quoi about it. With that little head scoop and the GT, I knew some from... French was coming in there. I Steve, love it. Uh, I, love that it. Coming, I knew what something was coming. I think this is a situation where uh, they had the right thing. They, they nailed the zeitgeist. And what what John Z. DeLorean knew was that if you took a car that was supposed to be plain Jane for quote unquote secretaries and, and teachers, and you put a fast engine in plus a manual transmission, and it actually performed, and you made it understated. Young people would be totally psyched, absolutely yeah. psyched. This was not a car for your father, not a car for your mom. It was a car for you if you were 18, 19, 20, 21, something like that. This was for you. It didn't cost that much money, but it had real performance. But it was understated, too. This is the last time Ford, GM, Chrysler, writ large, were cool. This is the last time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Boy, that is a death nail kind of comment, but I don't disagree. And Steph, you mentioned the hood scoop. You know, they had some visual clues on it to yes. let you know this was just not your normal car. You know, the twin tailpipes, which we don't have a photo of. But, you know, this was a car that just, if you were streetwise and you knew what you were looking at, you didn't challenge this car to stoplight. And then the next coolest feature that came from General Motors, the hood tachometer. Ooh, when you yeah. when the car pulled up so next to you and yep. you didn't see it, but you looked over and they had the tachometer on the hood, that was you knew. Oh yes, there's there's this guy's serious. And you know it's it's, it's interesting. And this this uh that today's episode is going to kind of sandwich between what we started off talking about, which was Jeep, 
which I don't even think all the beauty of what was Moab will, will pull off an Easter resurrection of that company, but they might. And you look at what this car did, which was a pretty, you know, it was not the big seller. It did not get the headlines. But when the GTO came out, they got all the press they could handle. And people did not love John Z. DeLorean, as a lot of times in big corporate hierarchies, you know, you got the dashing guy who keeps an open collared shirt, even though that, that press photo was him all stuffed up with his black tie. He was sort of a playboy-esque type guy, and he had an ego, like people who get stuff done sometimes have an ego. They said, if you don't sell 5,000 of these, and that's all they allocated for him because it was an option package on the, on the uh, Le Mans, or the temp is same body. And they said, if you don't sell 5,000 of these, uh, you probably want to be looking for another job. And he put it on the line as he did in his future as well. They sold in the first year over six times that number. They sold 32,450 units. Wow. The first year. And this that was, was pretty strong. This so was then the, it became its own line. This was the kickoff of the game. This game, this, yeah. the 64 GTO kicked off. The muscle car era went from 1964 to 1972. Hemi Cudas, Boss Mustangs, Mach 1 Mustangs, and then 442 Oldsmobiles, all these other cars. This was a wave. I can't believe it was only eight years. Insurance cost right. killed yeah. the muscle car era. Yeah, OPEC didn't help, but um, th really those, those two almost conspired to pretty much yes. put, put, do the death nail. But Steve, you're right. This was the car that all those others owe a little tip of the hat to. Absolutely. Yeah. And every time I see one, I, I know the history and I see early GTO and I'm like, yeah, I just see, I just go like, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's it. That's, that's the car. That's the one that started it all. Everybody bow and pay a little homage yeah. <laughs> to the yeah. GTO. Cause it's the one that started this whole thing. And th to this day in America, we're all about what you got under the hood. This car started, well, you could go back and say maybe the Chrysler 300 about what's under the hood, but this car really put it on the map and brought it to people's vision. But the Chrysler 300, I was, there was a lot to be owed to that car as well as about what's under the hood. But, yeah, this was, uh, by the way, <laughs> amazingly, 60 years ago. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Is that real? <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, you know, right. it's enough to make you almost mad at GM for certain things. What do you think about that, Steve? I, I they blew it after this. They <laughs> they had they had the world. This is back when they had sixty percent market share in the United States. One company, they were essentially they were close to a monopoly, and and uh, and they bit by bit, piece by piece, lousy car by lousy car, they blew it. And uh, I think it's such a shame. Which, by the way, takes me to where we are today. Um, takes me to my rant, yep. which I'm pissed off about this. Oh, when he takes his glasses All right, off, there we go. Back oh, up. The glasses I'm are back off. Up. Pissed he's off got about the that. Finger, I put it back up. Listeners, if you're not watching, he's got his <laughs> he's he's got his single <laughs> finger in the air, pointer finger, and he's waving it at us. Move I, away from the screen. This is kind of an amplification of a point I made when we were talking right, about chest of emotion here. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Beavies. And oh, glasses said, are off now. <laughs> the BV is you've got two, you got a family and you've got parents and you have two kids and the kids are adults, young adults. One kid went to Princeton and he got great grades and he's super, super smart, but he can't quite get a job yet. And he's working at Starbucks and the parents say, this kid's a genius. He's going to take over the world. He's going to rule the world. But Take right a bank now, trade money. Right. Yeah. Well, not that bad. He's not in jail, but he's working at Starbucks. Okay. Meanwhile, the other brother, the older brother, he runs a company. He does deep sea fishing. He goes out twice a year on his big boat and he brings in tons and tons of fish and he makes $500,000 a year. He never went to college and they're kind of like, they don't like talking about him. That's what GM is. And I'm talking about the GM big SUVs, Escalade, Tahoe, Yukon. These are the breadwinners of GM. And GM is embarrassed of them. And it makes me angry. Listen, I know there's a future. I know you've got to look to the future. I know you have to move forward. I get it. But listen, 
you, 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 on the one hand, you can't rest on your success. On the other hand, you don't walk away from it. And on the other hand, you should not be embarrassed of your success. All right, there's a picture of an Escalade. If you look at the Escalade, Tahoe, Suburban, Yukon, Yukon XL, they are responsible for over 300,000 units a year for GM. Guess what? They make at minimum $10,000 profit for GM. That's $3 billion a year for a vehicle they don't advertise, they don't talk about. They're embarrassed of this. Wait a minute. Did you just mean 10 grand, not per unit? Per car. Oh my God. See why I'm pissed off? That's incredible. They make $10,000 profit at least. The Escalade oh makes more God. than that. And by the way, GM does not tell you this. This is from Automotive News and other publications. They probably make more than $10,000 per profit per vehicle times 300000 It's $3 billion a year. And they're embarrassed of it. It pisses me off. You have moms. And again, moms all over the country, it doesn't matter what your income level, if you're rich and you can afford a Range Rover, you know what you get? A GMC Denali or GMC Denali XL. If you're a little bit less, less rich, I think this is interesting. The richest customers of these vehicles buy a GMC Denali. A little bit less, they get an Escalade. Escalade, this is again, Range Rover territory. Interesting that those two kind of swap places. I see why you If you're, you're like a yeah. teacher slash police officer, firefighter, you know, person who works at the grocery store, you're going to have a, a Tahoe. And if you are someone who is a substitute teacher and you don't make that much money, you're going to have a 10-year-old Tahoe. These vehicles are popular. Guess what else? Small businesses, uh, real estate agents have these. Uh, small business owners have these. A lot of them, they, they get a tax write-off, but they have them. They are police vehicles. They're government vehicles. They are all over the place. These vehicles make people happy. They make the world go round. And GM is embarrassed of them and won't talk about them. And it fucking pisses me off. They need. Well, they want to talk about their Chevy BEV that yes. laser e that they couldn't yep. get the market. They had to put stop sale on it. They're more proud of the Hummer BEV, the the anti you know, price. Once again, yes. All right, so there's my away. there's my fucking rant. Okay, I well. think it's a good rant, and you've got me fired up. I'm about to break something. But <laughs> Steve, Steve, but, but I mean, honestly, like if you're GM and you're listening, which you should be, but if you're GM and you're listening, then what does a person do like at GM? Are you saying that they should embrace and then let let the these money-making bread-and-butter SUVs that are floating the company, like you're yes. saying, that's the one that's bringing in the, the, in the bacon – do they then uh, embrace it as a brand and say we're the SUV type company? What what, what would you suggest? What is the I message? say? I say advertise them, update them, upgrade them, modernize them. So yeah. how about this? Go yeah. to a hybrid. Go to a plug-in hybrid. Make them more green. But don't say we're ditching the whole thing and we're going all hundred percent electric. The, right. There's no plug-in hybrid Escalade that's been talked about by GM. It only is complete 100% BEV. That's a mistake. For people who own an Escalade, it doesn't yep. work. They take it for road trips with their family. They're not going to want a BEV. How about saying, listen, it's going to get a little more green in five years, a little more green in 10 years. That's what I say. Yep. Well, you, know, you talked about earlier in the show, Porsche advertised 911, which you can't even go buy because they're all sold out. Ferrari advertises, Rolex advertises, even though you can't get them. GM needs to be advertising the vehicles because somebody may come in wanting a Yukon. They can't afford it. They get the lower down, the next vehicle, the Traverse, yes. the Blazer. So you advertise. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I'll have to admit here, dude, it's a little bit of a freaking unicorn. But who do you see right here? Look at this picture. Listener. Look at this picture, dude. This is me sitting in a GMC Yukon AT4. There you um, go. I want... I went hunting this last weekend, and the uh, the two boys. I don't see uncle, it. I don't want to see it? I don't see it either. You know, oh, here, hold it. Wait a minute. I see you. You're phone. not in the AT4. Okay. There. Oh, wait, oh there let it me, is. Uh, let me. I uh, a uh, little graphics mix. It should be right here. Share that one. So here, this is real unicorn listeners. There's a picture of me and a General Motors product. Okay. Photoshop. Photoshop. 
It is, but so I was hunting this last weekend, turkey hunting, and the, the two boys had gotten these from their uncle who just sold his car business and gave these to the kids as gifts. They're like, the boys are like almost 30. But this GMC Yukon AT4 with the big 6.2 V8, the suspension goes up and down off-road. This thing was gorgeous. I could clearly see why this appeals to their class of individual young single guys to appeal to me. It's got the three flip down seats. This needs to be all over the advertisements because this draws you in. It's a crown jewel. And then people buy the lesser stuff. Kind of like that racing, racing on Sunday sells on Monday. These things bring people to dealerships. And this is a General Motors product that I could I could clearly own. I'd like to compare it to an Expedition, but I think this is a better size than the Expedition or the Explorer. Very impressive vehicle. So I know you know as you're you're talking about it, and Steve, I swear I'm gonna like pitching in on your rant here because you make a great point that I'd not really considered before. If maybe I can afford, a, I'm not saying me, but if I'm looking at a Range Rover, maybe I'm looking at a a, a, a BMW SUV, a big seven. I may not want to send that statement to my neighbors, my customers, my friends, my church group. And yep. yes, this is one that I know is going to be reliable. I, I mean, I believe in GMC and Chevrolet as you know, all the GM products as being reliable. And I kind of don't have that belief of a Range Rover. I don't care how cool it looks. Yep. Well, it's like pulling up in an F-150 Platinum that's a $110,000 truck. People, oh, he's just got a Ford. Oh, he just got a GMC. But no, you pull up in the Range Rover, the Bent Yaga, yeah, yeah. whatever. It's People start looking at you very differently. But I mean, that that, that vehicle stickered out at about $98,000, which Good. is a shit ton of money. <laughs> but I mean, it, but it, it was lot. super, super sophisticated. It goes up and down and has all the different modes. I mean, super impressive piece of kitsch. From yeah. General Motors that they don't talk about. Yeah, they're embarrassed of it, and that's yes. that's my rant. So I got all you. right. So we all agree, and uh, we're, we're our last segment because we are getting short of time. Is you are CEO of uh, Stellantis, and you're in charge of Jeep, and you can make any Jeep you want. We had a lot of fun with Ford. I remember we had a great time with Ford yeah. and BMW. So I want to do the same thing with Jeep, uh, since it is Easter and the whole Moab thing. And uh, uh, let me start because I think you guys will probably have something more interesting than mine. The Wagoneer and the Grand this Wagoneer. This is tricks with Stefan. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, this, yes. is, this, this is so... like a pre-tropping of the <laughs> other choices. Yes. yes. <laughs> I I don't really like Jeeps, so I didn't really yeah. get too excited about this. I'm, I'm um, with you there. So the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer, these are vehicles they should have made 10 years ago. All they yeah. are is the Dodge Ram pickup platform with an suv on top of it by the way the gn and escalate is just a chevy truck with a fancier body and the expedition is an f-150 with a it's, it's an suv so that's all this is is a dodge ram pickup but i picked the grand wagoneer but i made it off-road so if you scroll down a little bit uh there it is so Ooh. tough tires yeah. tough wheels uh the kind of wheels that don't that don't fall off when you're off-road that uh, Andrew Clark was Bead talking about. I want that. Bead I do want to, I want to get it black like this, like a, a frozen type of black. And uh, I want it to look just like this, but a little bit nasty, a little bit nasty. Bit nasty. It will have, because I'm CEO of Stellantis, it's going to have the very last Hellcat ever made. Uh -oh. I'm going to not put it in a challenger. I'm going to say, you're going to put that in my grand Wagoneer. Yeah. So this has a Hellcat 707 horsepower because that's the you SRT. That. You don't you want need, the, yeah, need that's that. the you, SRT motor. When you go off road, you need 700 horsepower. <laughs> yeah, you do. And, and you're going to need those horsepower to overcome the aerodynamic drag of those lights. <laughs> so yeah, listen, this thing is, <laughs> but it's super it's got six fog, yellow fog lights <laughs> across the top of the windshield on this thing. Classic. Those Steve are not fog maneuver. lights. Those are retina dissolved. <laughs> <lights>. <laughs> All right, so what do you got? All right, so let me close out that. So I, I yeah, went there, Steve. I, kinda, I, like Steve -O, I went a little similar to you, but I'm doing the. I'm going with the Grand Cherokee, Cherokee. L. Um, I just 
I can't that that there's that C that C pillar on that the one you pick. I just can't deal with that. So I'm going to the Grand Cherokee L, which has got bases. It's their long wheelbase version of the Grand Cherokee. I like the looks of this a lot better. Same thing as you. I'm going with the diamond black crystal pearl coat paint, which I just absolutely love. Full on tint through all the windows. Um, I know the Europeans like clear glass. I don't like clear glass. This is America. I want this thing to look a little bit nasty. And I'm putting the SRT 707 horsepower motor in this thing. Kind of like the old Trailhawk. So this will have that. And then I would make it, I'd change the wheels on this and do a little bit of stuff like you. But it'd be one of those, to me, this would be that kind of SUV that, you know, people, it goes by people, they don't notice it really. But then they're like, whoa, wait a minute. And just a little bit on the nasty side because it's got that nasty V8 in it, which is just so exciting. And wait, which another, motor did you pick? Is that the big the six? I went with the SRT motor, which okay. is seven, which was seven hundred seven. I didn't go with the 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 very last motor, which is like what a thousand horsepower. I went with the SRT. The red the, the red, the red eye is the red eye is eight hundred. Okay. Uh, I I agree. I think. I think 700 uh, is okay. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll get you by in a pinch. <laughs> All right, Adam, what you got? Well, I tell you, I toned it down a little bit. Um, Whoa, you, that's so 70s. We mentioned the honcho earlier, at least the word came tell people out. What to tell the people what a honcho is. This oh, is this, man. I remember this. I do, this too. This is back, I think. I think Jeep called this platform maybe the J10, and they took the Wagoneer platform or the, or the or the station wagon platform, and they just chopped the back off of it and <laughs> put a truck bed on it, and they called it their truck. And it's just the coolest looking thing. It's got the crazy flares. It's got uh, what we used to call Wrangler wheels, which before they my Jeep had those. Yeah, the white, they were the like, white Wrangler rims. Yep. They didn't white, call it the steel. truck. They called it the Honcho. That's the what honcho. they actually called it. Isn't yes. that great? And so that that's what that was. It had a little bit of a graphics package and it had a um sort of a roll bar only a plumber could love because I don't think it really would protect you in a rollover. But it was cool looking. It had a little bit of a stance. I personally just dislike intensely the Gladiator, which I think is the next uh, view. Yeah. I mean, I, that's just a goofy looking thing. I hate and, it. I don't like it either. You know, it's funny. My eyes sort of deceived me for a second. The way the perspective is, it looks like that building is like on top of the roof. Yeah. It would probably help the looks of that vehicle, but it's just a goofy looking thing. They took a Wrangler. They were going to like save a little bit on the um, the economies of scale by using the Wrangler, but they didn't. They chopped the frame and they extended it 10 inches. Then they had to reinforce it. So Jeep has a whole lot more cost in this, unlike what you were saying, Steve, earlier about you know, the, the, the Suburbans and Denali is making 10 grand a unit. Jeep has given up a lot of their profit margin just by, first of all, waiting too dang long to come out with the truck. And secondly, by spending too much to build this. So since I have some idle employees because my sales are down 22%, mm. I'm going to take Jeep's big seller here, the Grand Cherokee. This is the L. Straight, the L, yeah, with, yes. with the, the third third seat. And uh, I've got a couple of metal fabricators that I know who are sitting around look at, looking at the walls and looking at the clock, and they're going to go to the next graphic and chop the back off oh. of it. And there's a, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Photoshop did not pull off exactly how I want that last pillar to, to look like, the C pillar, to maybe curl it in a little bit a la Hyundai Santa Fe Ford. Mm. Maver uh, Maverick, uh, a, a little bit of the sport slash street truck that no one offers because the towing capacity of the car-like trucks is so poor and the construction workers and the people who are really hauling stuff don't want a car-like truck. I want to have a truck-like truck that has a car look. I'm going to put the smaller Hemi up front, the 5.7 of which GM has a few zillion laying around. I don't need 600 or 700 or 1,000 horsepower. I'll be, oh, well, of course you do. I'll be, well, that, that could be the later. It's not about need. I'll be, ha I'll be happy with 400, and I will showcase this at every auto event they'll invite me to and hopefully sell a couple. All right. I, I like it. <laughs> there it is. My, my new Jeep honcho with the 5.7. <laughs>
I see we're going to have Hacho graphics, right? You're going to like have the, the, big thing have on the side yeah. Hacho yeah. graphics. <laughs> Got to have Hacho graphics. Uh, I love it. All right. Well, uh, I think we just, uh, I, you know, none of us really are psyched about Jeep, but those are three pretty cool Jeeps. I owned a Jeep. I lived with it. You know, I had a CJ7 with the soft top. Froze my ass off in the winter, sweated in the summer. You know, it was very cool as a chick magnet in college in high school, but it's not something at my current age with gray hair that I'd want to drive every day. I rode an Andrews Rubicon. It was very nice. He's got those giant fit 37 inch rims of tires on it. Soft ride, but it's still just a Jeep and it does it's an off-road vehicle. And so for me, now I'd go with the the Grand Cherokee. That'd be more my size. I like the styling, but that's what I'd go with. And if I can just a yeah. last thing about Jeep, Jeep the brand. This was a Jeep that was born out of the United States military, as we all know. There is not another brand to me that makes you want to put your hand over your heart. And to see this brand, this once proud brand, yeah. very much a brutish military off-road, rugged thing, mentioning all the unreliability. Consumer Reports ranked it as the lowest uh, reliability of any American-made or um, American-backed company, and it's just sad. And so, Jeep, if you're listening, we're for you. No, we're not fans now, but we're not fans now because you made us non-fans now. Bring it back, red, white, and blue. Give us some rugged dependability and build some vehicles people want to buy. Yeah, yeah I totally I, – thank you, Adams. I, amen. And – uh, they they discontinued their V8 Wrangler, which was stupid. Uh, they had this this stupid V8 we, Wrangler. It cost an arm and a leg. Number two coming out this. Episode. I think it cost a hundred thousand dollars. That was stupid. You know what they need here? Are, we we are all going to agree on this. I'm going to say something. You guys are going to agree hundred percent. They need a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon Raptor and oh, yes. more power, but a V6, not yeah. a crazy yeah. stupid V8. Give me yep. a give me a, a Wrangler Rubicon Raptor. Now you've got something. Yep. If Ford GT can do it with the V6, oh my gosh, the bond. Can. <laughs> Here you go. How about this picture, fellas? The, how there, old, how old are you? Ball. <laughs> so I just uh, listen. I just loaded up a picture from. Um, I flipped a Jeep in college in 1980, and um, I'm sitting in the front. This is a picture of me in the passenger seat, and the roll bar is below the level of my head. You can see it crushed on the rear tire. Um, it blew out the other side in the front wheel shield crush when we rolled it. But this is before the Ranger where they had so many rollovers in these Jeep. They widened the wheelbase because it was so easy to get this thing up on two wheels. But they're those white steelies that I love so much. Um, and, of course, I had the denim brown interior and a red Jeep. It was it was very cool. I had it rebuilt, and uh, it went on to uh, see plenty more good times. But I lived with a Jeep once. I'm done with that. All That's right, that'll amazing. Be the... That car lasted through that and was rebuilt to live again. Yes. Incredible. All right, that'll be the final words. It's fun. Close us out. We're out of time. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching or listening. Remember to like, listen, subscribe, hit that bell button on YouTube, and uh, leave comments, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>